I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. When we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative. Conversation without compromise. I first came across your name about 15 years ago when I was like preparing for a Bible study on Abraham and Jezebel. Ah, uh, Jezebel. I, I haven't read. I'm still, on, yeah, I'm still half in love with Jezebel. <laughs> I, I really want to go back and read the book now, but I, I remember very distinctly that you said in an interview that when you were visiting the place of Elijah's birth, you were attacked by a pack of dogs. Wild dogs, wolf dogs. I mean, they really were. Um, and you know, Jezebel, I mean, the curse of Elijah and Jezebel was that she would be thrown to the dogs off the walls, off her palace walls, which in fact happened. She was thrown to the dogs and eaten by them. Uh, you know, and, I mean, they were literally the dogs of war, right? Wild dogs that were trained, just, you know, really, really aggressive. But these ones, well, when it happened, you know, I decided I had to find the place where Elijah was from, which was, is now in Jordan, in Northern Jordan. And then, you know, this happened. I got attacked by this <laughs> pack of wild wolf dogs. I mean, literally, thank God I was in a car, I was driving. I got the windows wound up in time, but they were literally, I mean, one of them was on the hood and the drool, you know, the bare fangs and drool dripping down in front of me. And, oh. Ah. And I sort of had to back down as quick as I could before they got to the tires, in which case I'd be really screwed. Um, but I remember getting back down to the, and it was on a rough road, I'm getting back down to the actual road and driving on a little bit and then stopping the car and realizing that I was shaking literally all over. And then thinking, I cannot put this in the book. It is too perfect. I mean, it is just too, it's not even a metaphor. I mean, it's just too real. Nobody's going to believe it. And then like an idiot. And I knew I shouldn't have done it. It's one of those things writers know, but they do it nonetheless. I put it in the book, the biography I wrote of Jezebel. And of course, everybody thinks I made it up. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to make something up, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a better imagination. and It's going to be more metaphorical than that. It actually happens, but I should put it in the book. I knew it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I, but if it helps you feel better, I believe you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, so then I, 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 didn't, I, I hadn't read any of your work until uh, I started using Audible. I, I've been walking and listening to audiobooks a lot the last year. It uh -huh. helps me do exercise. And I read your book after the prophet and I loved it. It was, I could not stop listening to it. It was incredible. And the only thing that stopped me from immediately listening to your biography of Muhammad is that you weren't the audible narrator for that one. Whereas I wanted to, I wanted to, but it wanted me to go all, all the way across the country for nothing, peanuts, right? In order right. to do it. So, you know, you pay me properly or, you know, <laughs> it takes a lot to get me on an airplane. Well, it takes, it takes nothing to get me on an airplane right now because none of us could go on an airplane right, right. now. Um, but, you know, airplanes are such a totally awful mode of travel for the last 20, 30 years. I and mean, I remember the time you used to get all dressed up and it was something special, you know, and now it's just, you're stuck there in this tiny aluminum tube sort of packed in like sardines and breathing bad air. And, <laughs> the experience has changed for me. I used to not like it much. Then I started traveling with my kids and traveling with kids when they're one and two, the, the sort of between one and two age where they can't watch anything. 
that's that's a hard age to fly, and you have that's a lot of luggage. Brave. That's called brave. It's called intrepid, but certainly. Y- yes. Uh, so, so, but now, whenever I fly on my own, it's an immensely <laughs> relaxing experience. <laughs> in contrast to that. <laughs> so, I, I've quite I've learned to quite enjoy the airport and the and the. It's become like a second home because my in-laws are in California. My parents are back in Northampton. So the airport's just an inevitable part of life. The yeah. only disadvantage to living in Seattle is that it's a long way away from everywhere. Right. Of course, some would say that that is the advantage too. <laughs> yep. It's, it's, it's a fun place to be. How long have you been here now? Ooh, since 1990. However long that is. Uh, it's about 28 years. I don't like thinking about 1992 as being that long ago, but it is. So I'm 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 really curious because yeah. you you uh, describe yourself as a, would you call yourself a Jewish agnostic or an agnostic Jew or is that arbitrary? Either or. <laughs> I'm an agnostic and I do so you know you can put them together any way you like. <laughs> I'm a few other things too, but you know. So, I mean, we're all multiply hyphenated. You know, any way you describe yourself is going to have a whole pile. Of, I'm a Greek, I'm British, I'm a writer, I'm a psychologist, I'm a feminist, I'm a this, I'm a that, and so on, so on, so on. So, you know, it sort of keeps on going. So, uh, but and whichever facet of your being you choose to emphasize at a certain point. So, in this context, in the context of this cast, I guess I'm an agnostic too. But just be warned, I have a few other things besides. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's part of the fun. So I'm, I'm really curious. So I think one thing we have in common, we're yeah. both non-Muslims who interact significantly with the Islamic source materials. Uh-huh. So I'm really curious for you, as an agnostic Jew, at what point did religion become so interesting to you? Uh, you know... I have to, okay, I have to tell you, I kind of, I'm really uncomfortable around the word religion. Okay. Because it comes freighted with so much orthodoxy and such stereotypes. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a, basically, it's a, it's, it's a noun that describes such a vast range of practice, of belief, of faith, which two very different things, by the way, of, of being, of thinking. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you do have to take my background into consideration. You know, as a kid, I went, I was the only Jew in a convent school in England, which um, you would have thought would turn me off the whole idea altogether, which is like, no, you would have thought I'd walk away with that, well, a curse on both your houses, Catholicism and Judaism, but it didn't for some reason. It's always, it interests me very much as a psychologist, this whole issue of belief and of faith. Um, and of what they lead people to do or not do. Um, so I'm fascinated by it as a phenomenon. Um, and, uh, but I'm also fascinated by, by it as, you know, we tend to think of religion as, you know, well, do you believe or not believe, which is particularly strong among, among uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims. You know, we tend to measure your Muslimness, as it were, by whether you are a believer or not, if you're an infidel or whatever, or an agnostic Jew. But, but um, I really think, I really believe, <laughs> I really think, basically, belief is another word for think. I really think that belief is a, a fairly minor part of religion for most people who are practicing, who are religious, that much more important parts are that sense of identity, identity in terms of community, identity in terms of family, identity in terms of your, your ancestors and so on. You're hewing to a, a tradition and, and that becomes very much a part of your identity, especially when other modes of identity are fractured or threatened. Um, this happens a lot in the Middle East. You have a, you know, you, you, what does it mean to be Syrian anymore? What does it mean to be Iraqi anymore? You know, those, those countries have been exploded literally, as well as figuratively. So what's left is Shia and Sunni, much, much older traditions, right? So there's a hewing to that. Um, I mean, I'm not 
quote unquote religious in the sense of a practicing Jew at all, but there's a mezuzah on my front door. And I would never dream of living in a place without a mezuzah on the front door. You know, a mezuzah is where the, it, it's a little ambit on the front door with a, a, a tiny, well, it should have a little tiny prayer inside. It's the Shema, which is the equivalent of the, of the, um, of the Shahada in, in, in Islam. Um, Except the prayer kept falling out of mind, so I tossed it. It's <laughs> it's there as a it's there as a symbol. It's there as a symbol of identity. A Jew lives here. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't sound it. But basically, God damn it, I'm a Jew, right? Um, uh, on the anniversaries of my parents' deaths, I will light a memorial candle for them, and I will say Kaddish. Now, I don't believe a single word of the Kaddish prayer, which, by the way, has nothing to do with death. It's all about glorification of God and how great God is. And so I don't believe a single word of it. It doesn't matter. I say it. Because I honor them by doing so. And I honor myself as part of my identity too. So it's, it's, this is what I mean by it's sort of built into us in deeper ways than I think any of us realize. We think, well, okay, it's a matter of observing, you know, you say prayer however many times a day, or you, you know, uh, do all the mitzvot and you, you know, you know, obey all the rules and all the <laughs> rules and regulations and so on. But to me, um, real faith and the most deeply, for lack of a better word, religious people I know, um, it's not about rules and regulations. It's about what Kierkegaard called that leap to faith. It's about, um, you have faith, you know it's not logical. You know it's deeply emotional. You know this is not a matter of reason, it's a matter of emotion. This is what we mean by faith. Um, and it's an argument I've had in particular with Muslims who seem to, uh, well, many Muslims, um, who seem to want it to be rational to be a believer. Uh, I can't accept that basically it's a poetic act. It's an act of poetry. It's an act of, it, it goes beyond reason to something larger and, and, and more mysterious and more, I'm not sure, more poetic. I think it really is a matter of poetry rather than science or reason. So I, I, I'm... You look disturbed by that. I, I, I'm, I, I disagree with it uh, completely, but it's... Uh, oh, great. That's so why. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think... Um, in, I, I, I guess I, I don't disagree completely, completely, but I think that ultimately, for me, the, the metaphysical and the physical world kind of do go hand in hand with each other. But I, I would say I do agree with it not being about rules and regulations that I think religion, like true religion, that God is acceptable to God is not about, I'm better than this person. I've got to, I have to obey these rules in order to be accepted. It is about, it's about a living trust in God, which gets to a much deeper essence of what is true rather than the exact technicalities of the rules. But as far as, uh, as far as like history, right. I'm, uh, I guess all the parts of the Bible that seem most crazy, I take, literally so would be <laughs> very different camps but i'm curious for you you're writing about the history of islam quite a lot so what's what's been your journey with say the islamic source material because reading your books you know your stuff well how did that happen well you know uh to me I know this may come as a surprise to many. These aren't so much books about Islam per se as about the Middle East. To me, they're very, very much Middle East books. I wrote two, it's almost part of a series that I wrote a book about a biography of Mary, as in Virgin, Virgin Mary, um, which uh, the subtitle was a flesh and blood biography. And it started off with a very simple question, like who was she really? the actual person, this 13-year-old peasant girl in first century Palestine under occupation, the Roman occupation at the time, who was she? Who must she have been? No, could she have been? 
And then I wrote a biography of Jezebel, as in not virgin. But again, with the, the same question, who was she really, this Phoenician princess? married to the king of this podunk little kingdom up in the hills called Israel as a kind of diplomatic marriage and so on, um, bringing with her all her priests and so on. And was her alphabet, by the way, uh, uh, Phoenicia, where she came from. Uh, the Hebrew alphabet comes from, directly from the Phoenician alphabet. So without Jezebel, basically, the Bible would never have been written. <laughs> Except she became, you know, the bad girl of the Bible because, you know, never, here's the, here's, here's the moral of the story of Jezebel. Never let your story be told by your enemies. But, but in any case, after that, I was sitting with a friend and I remember the year, it was 2004. And he said, you should, you should write, you should write a biography of, and he came up with Moses. And I said, well, no, because, you know, there's no, there's no there there. It's too far back. It's too much, you know, legend and myth. And I can't see a real person there. And I have to be able to see a real person. And then he said, Muhammad. And I said, you have to be kidding an agnostic Jew and a woman writing a, no way, not with that, no way, not going there. Um, but in any case, uh, I was between books at the time, and you know, when writers are between books, they read all over the place. So I actually did pick up a few biographies of Muhammad. Uh, most of them, I have to say, were what my Irish mother would have called a snooze. Uh, they were so reverent. I mean, they were written with immense love and immense reverence, but too much reverence, it becomes just Hey, geography, you know, th there's, no, there's no sense of the man himself there. And, and, you know, I wanted to know who he really was. And then uh, I read uh, Ibn Ishaq's, uh, the, uh, uh, his biography. Sirah Azulala. <laughs> the Sirah, right. And that was wonderful. I was, you know, it was really began, it was juicy. It was, oh, and it was just full of wonderful detail. And I began to get really excited, uh, but I still wasn't going to go anywhere near the whole subject. And that was uh, just at that point was when that horrendous series of attacks took place in uh, Karbala in Iraq, uh, the Sunni on Shia, and the same friend who, you know, I'd been talking to him about, you know, what I discovered about Muhammad, uh, said, I don't get it, he said. Everything you're telling me about Muhammad, the prophet of unity, one people, one God, you know, know, unite all the tribes behind the banner of God. Uh, he was a prophet of unity. So how could he leave behind him from what you're telling me practically on his deathbed, this ghastly legacy of division and bloodshed between Shia and Sunni? And I thought, you know, that is a very good question. And I started looking into it, and most of the time I found um, sort of those ghastly nutshell things, you know, like, oh, some family squabble over the succession to Muhammad. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. Something this big, and you're putting it down in one sentence as the family. I mean, talk about dismissiveness. But I kept on reading, and that's when I discovered Al Tabari. Now, Al Tabari is like, Ibn Ishaq squared, cubed. <laughs> Ibn Ishaq Sirah is one, but it's a thousand page volume, but it's still in one volume. Al Tabari, his tarikh, his history, was translated into English volume by volume over more than a decade in the 1990s. And to 39 volumes in English. And it is amazing. I, he used the same method as Ibn Ishaq, and it was oral history. So was, here's what they both did. These wonderful early Islamic historians, the earliest Islamic historians, they went from person to person all around the Muslim empire at the time, getting stories, you know, getting people to tell their stories. But of course, you know, there was some generations apart from when Muhammad was actually alive. So they would record what they called the Isnad, the chain of communication. So one person would say, I heard this from A, who heard this from B, who heard this from C, who was there and happened. 
and the next one would say, like, oh, I heard this from D, who heard this from E, who heard this from F, who was there when I had it. And then the lines would start crossing and you'd get, well, I heard this from Q, who heard this from B, who heard this from Z, who was there when I this on. And sometimes you would get this way, you would get maybe 20, 30 descriptions of the same scene or the same conversation. And each time, there's that sense, you know, the, of, of the person telling the story. Some of them are telling it in the first person. Some, some of them are telling it only in dialogue. Some of them are, some of them you can tell being worked over and it's hagiographic and it's reverential and so on. Okay. But, you know, if you know the Middle East, if you have a, a feel for the culture and, and the place and the language, which I do because I lived there for, you know, 13 years, um, you you can sense what's real you know what what just feels real it was like these people were talking to me across the centuries i could hear them i could practically see them as they talked all the gestures the hand gestures and everything and i felt like i was in the middle of this vast grapevine of arabian gossip right um and i could i could tease out you know what was real and what wasn't real and inside all these stories I mean, some of them were so detailed. There was one, either they were amazingly good fiction writers, which I don't believe, or they were just really good raconteurs. There was one, he was talking about one of Hussein's nephews coming out of the tent at Karbala in order to do single combat. And he describes this youth coming out of the tent with his face shining like a moon, pale with fear and so on. And he says, the strap on one of his sandals was loose. I, I'm not sure which one, but I think it was the right one. And I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, I mean, it just, it, it, it's that kind of detail. And it was just immensely exciting. It felt like I could just leap across literally half the world from here in Seattle to Arabia. Uh, and half of history from the 21st century back to the 7th century. And it was this, this sense that, this sense, you know, that history, you know, take out the HI, history is story, right? Right. Um, it's not boring. When, when it comes alive in this way, when it excites you in this way, it becomes, um, it's spellbinding. And, and I began to get this, well, I think, you know, who knows? It sounds like very, um, it, it's hubris on my part. I'm perfectly aware of this, but it felt like every day I got up here in Seattle and I looked out, you know, I live on a, on a houseboat on a lake in Seattle and I looked out across the mist in the morning mist and so on. And I was back in seventh century Arabia with Muhammad. You know, it's like almost, it, 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 was, it was the most amazing feeling due to these two wonderful gentlemen, Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari, who put things down and put it down in writing all those centuries ago. So I considered that what I wanted to do was to do justice to the story of this amazing life. Um, it was to, to trace it in its fullness, to, to accord Muhammad <clears throat> not the respect of hagiography, not reverence, he's not my prophet, but to record, accord him what I consider the most basic respect of a life fully lived. To give him back his life, to recreate his life. Um, and that's what I tried to do. I, I like what you're saying about Al, Al Tabari, and I think a lot of this is true in other places in the Islamic source material. So, I one thing that always stood out really clear to me because before I read Tabari or uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq, I, I read through the uh, Sahi Hadith, two of them anyway, and I remember just everything with Aisha in it. Yeah, I, is just, <laughs> Aisha talked a lot. She talked a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I she she has to be one of the most interesting women in all of human history. She, I, I would, I, I remember, think, I remember. Uh, reading about her and thinking this would be such a good movie or TV series, but it would obviously never get made. But 
your book kind of came the closest to that that I've experienced so far. So I got to thank you for that because she's fascinating. She is absolutely fascinating. She, um, she could not be silenced. <laughs> she was out there. In front. I mean, even leading an, uh, leading an army of 10,000 soldiers against Ali in the Battle of the Camel, right? She was riding on top of the camel. I mean, what? You're not anyone's image of a 7th century Muslim woman, right? <laughs> right. Uh, she was outspoken. She lived longer than anyone else, of course, was up, so she got to... Uh, <laughs> that's why so many of the Hadith were, uh, you know, attributed to her. Uh, and it's also why so many of the ones attributed to her were kind of deleted over the centuries. Uh, but she is, um, yeah, she, it, it, you, could not, you could not invent a stronger character. She was just, just, just wonderful. Uh, I, yeah, I think I, I made a video about her a couple of years back and I ended up, I remember I ended up saying, I'm not sure that I would have liked her, but I know I admire her. Right, this seventh century woman who would have been utterly at home in the twenty first century. Right, right, and I, I, I've, I've gotten to know a, a lot of uh, Saudis over the last few years, and mm -hmm. I think there is something that, when you get an exceptional woman from that kind of culture, they often tend to be really exceptional because the the pressure and the dynamics just yeah. cause mm -hmm. things to grow in people that aren't that aren't there normally, and. Yeah. Clearly, that's happened to her. That she has had these really bizarre life experiences and has really run with them a long way. Oh, for sure. If Aisha were alive today, she'd have been, you know, leading the the the, the drive for women to drive. She'd have been leading the drive for women to you know, have their own bank accounts, to be independent, to have their own passports, and so on. And, so on. and uh, she'd be in jail and being tortured by the Sauds. On that note. On that I, note, Aisha yeah. in modern times, the the she in jail. She would she would be in jail in Saudi Arabia right now, probably. Yes, or I'm studying sure. internationally, managing to escape it. The it's hard to catch her. <laughs> <laughs> now, so actually, I you might be interested to know this, but when I first started meeting Muslims, the first biography that a Muslim recommended me, I read about Muhammad's life was yours. Wow. Um, thank you. Whoever that was, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you want me saying her name, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll credit her offline later. Uh, was it Manam? Manam? No, no, no. Um, but clearly, did you expect that when you wrote this, you'd have such a kind of wide resonance Not with Muslims? Not at all. Uh, both these books, both After the Prophet, which is about the Shia Sunni spit, and uh, The First Muslim. Oh, I, I should add here for those who are questioning, you know, I know that there is a tradition that Abraham was the first Muslim or Adam was the first Muslim, but I should point out the title comes directly from the Quran, where Muhammad three times in the Quran is said, is told, Muhammad, say, I am the first Muslim. So it's, it's a direct quote from the Quran. Uh, but no. I wrote both books for non-Muslims. It, it didn't do to me that Muslims would be interested in anything I had to say or found out about Muhammad or about uh, early Islam, about the Shia Sunni split. Um, and what happened was that uh, in 2010, well, that's it. I'd already written after the Prophet, and it was well received, but it hadn't sort of soared or anything, right? Uh, and in 2010, I'd already begun work on the biography of Muhammad, and a friend knew I was working on it and was organizing the first TEDx Renia, the first TEDx in Seattle. And she said, Leslie, you know, have you ever heard of TED? And I said, TED who? You know? <laughs> and uh, she explained and said, well, you know, maybe you'd like to talk about Muhammad. You know, we can give you nine minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure, nine minutes to talk about it. That's amazing life. Are you kidding me? And then I thought about it, and I thought, well, okay, but I could, you know, it's part of the preparation. I have been reading the Quran very, very slowly and carefully. Uh, and uh, I said, I can talk about the way I've been reading the Quran. You know, I thought it would take me three weeks and it took me three months. Um, that I can think I can do in nine minutes. She said, fine. So 
I'm in the St. Paul of Benaroya Hall, which is the concert hall here in Seattle. I think it seats about 500, maybe 800 people. And I thought, okay, I'm into 500, 800 people here in Seattle. You know, it didn't occur to me that it was being filmed. And it certainly didn't occur to me that it was going to be online. And it certainly never, ever occurred to me that the words Leslie Hazelton and viral in the sense of going viral on, online, not in the current sense of viral, right. uh, would go together in the same sentence. But it got picked up by what I call Big Ted. Um, and it went viral. Um, and... And I had said, you know, I, 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 since I thought I was just to a few hundred people, I said, you know, what I gave was the reason I was reading the Quran the way I did, that I was writing a biography of Muhammad. And, you know, it seemed like I should be very well acquainted with the words that are, uh, um, we can most reliably say he actually uttered, right? Came out of his mouth. It was just, you know, the most basic research for me to be very, very well acquainted with those words. Uh, but in any case, then I found out that I, it felt suddenly like I had announced to all the one point, however many billion, 1.2 or 1.6, I've forgotten, over the world that I was writing this book because I started hearing from the, by, by email by the, through the blog I was writing at the time, the accidental theologist through uh, 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 online, on Facebook, on Twitter, and so on and so on. And everybody, not everybody, a lot of them were really concerned that I get it right, as they put it. Right? And I replied to them all, and I said, you know, I'm pretty sure that I will not get it right in the sense that I will get it as you would want it, right? Because I'm not Muslim. I am an agnostic Jew, right? And I, my aim is to give him the integrity of a a full life lived to 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 try and recreate him to the best of my ability. My ability is not infinite. I am I am a woman, and I'm really sure that the book I will write will be the book that you would want me to write. But please be assured that I will do my very very best. And you know, sort of, they would write back and say, "Thank you so much. We place our trust in you." And I, <laughs> it was very moving. It was really very, very moving to have that kind of support. And, um, and very moving too, after the first Muslim was published, the reactions from Muslims all over the world were, um, I mean, sometimes I was moved to tears, you know, by the, by the, the, the gratitude, and the thanks. Um, and, you know, to, people would say, you, you made him real to me. You made him human in a way he never was before. Right, um, you allowed me to see him, to feel him, to touch him in a way that I never could before. And so, on. Um, yeah, I'm kind of tearing up as I as I, I just talk about all those messages because they were they were it was humbling and moving and um, yeah. And so you got a lot of positive reactions. Do you get any negative reactions? Uh you know, the good thing about the crazy fundamentalists is that they don't read. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, I also have a huge advantage over, uh, as, as regards, uh, fun, crazy fundamentalists. I have a huge advantage over a Muslim biographer. That's that since I'm not Muslim, they can't put a fatwa on me. I mean, they may want to kill me anyway, but, you know, that's, that's their problem. <laughs> um, it's... Um, I was aware there might be a negative reaction. There was very, very little. Um, and when there was some, um, it was mainly online. And what happened was that other Muslims would jump on in. And basically they would say, cool it, brother, she's okay. I was like, wow, thank you. <laughs> you know, it was, again, God, tearing up again. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was very moving. Right, that, that, that's often the case. That I, I found that being involved in the Muslim community, I get very little uh, negative reaction. And if there is, there's usually people very quick to defend me in those yeah. settings as well. So that, that's yeah. consistent with my experience yeah. there. Yeah, but very gently too. I mean, you know, they're not, it, it, 
in any antagonistic way or anything. Just really cool it, brother. It's, I love that. It's lovely. Well, I think it, I, I think I, I resonate with what you're saying as far as humanizing it. That, that I think that's one of the difficulties of, of uh, Islamic history is that it's also sacred that it actually prevents people from learning real lessons that could be learned from it. And when you make these things human stories and actually look at people's lives rather than just having a, it's the Sahaba, everything's utopia, let's just accept everything, then you're missing out on the real lessons you can learn from history and actually grow from as a culture. Well, what you're also missing out on is the fact that uh, Muhammad has told numerous times in the Quran to say to the citizens of Mecca and Medina, I'm just one of you. I am just the messenger. I am one of you. Right? Uh, that he's not superhuman. He is not sacrosanct. Uh, and uh, that he is not sacred, revered, yeah, respected, okay, respected. I think that's, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be respected, he wanted to be heard. He needed to be respected, he needed to be heard. But you know, sometimes the reverence is so great that it borders on um, worship. Uh, and that I think is a great concern. Uh, in the sense that, you know, Jesus is the object of worship in Christianity. Um, that, I think, is a subject of concern. It's, um, to me, these are very, very human documents, the, uh, the Bible and the Quran. Uh, inspired, most definitely, obviously, right? Written by men. Written down by men, right? Uh, it's uh, and when you make it sacred, when you make it sacrosanct, when you make it unquestionable, what you're doing is knowing the way that history is made, you know, that, it's hit, that history is written down, it changes over time. That's why I went back as early as I could to Iraq and Al Tabari because. They're the earliest that we still have, the earliest sources that we still have, besides the Quran itself. Um, you know, there have been so many changes made over time, so many changes in the Hadith made over time, so many changes in the way they are interpreted over time. And just take, just take how the into being, the hijab and niqab came into being. And we talk about things changing over time. You know the story. It's there were so many people coming to to Muhammad's basically hut right at the side of the mosque Khand in Medina that uh, they were just crowding in there and there was no privacy. So a revelation came down: hang a curtain, <laughs> right? It was curtain, right? So it was the, you know the wise would have some privacy. We went about with it, you know. Person after person after person after person after person coming to him for advice, for directions, and so on and so on. And over time, what happened? And this is what the, the um, there was nothing in the Quran about women veiling or even about job. It says that both men and women shall dress modestly. That's what it says. Precisely what it says and more. But what happened over time was that. The curtain became a smaller, smaller, and smaller until it became a face curtain, basically. Uh, and those kind of curtains marks in the Middle East at the time of high rank. Only high status women wore veils or you know, big, you know, short, beautiful head coverings and so on because they didn't have to do manual labor. And you try doing manual labor or dressed up like that and so on. It's hard, right? Uh, so it became a status thing. And then over the years, it got interpreted more and more literally. It's just the problem is literalism, you know. Um, 
the the spirit of something gets lost when you get overly liberal you lose the spirit i mean that's the problem with fundamentalism fundamentalism is so literate it's so stuck to the most basic obvious and you distorted meaning of every word that it loses the spirit i can give you a perfect example uh and it's an example that comes up in uh translation and that's when it says quran is a few time it talks about jihad right which is usually translated because most of these translations into English were done in the 19th century as uh, fighting in the cause of God or warfare in the cause of God, which causes that, which is exactly how radical fundamentalist extremists like the Taliban and ISIL and so on and Boko Haram interpret it. They understand it. But you know, Look at what these words actually mean. Jihad does not mean warfare, and it does not mean fighting. There are other words those in the Quran. What it means is striving, struggle, striving on a hard path. Fisbil, in the path, not the cause. He says, yay, yay, political cause. No, path, like the Tao in Taoism, of God. Striving in the path of God becomes warfare in the cause of God. This is what happens when you lose when you lose both the spirit and the actual sense of the text. Right? Um, it's misinterpreted. It's distorted. It it's, uh, gets lost and used. And manipulated in very very ugly ways yeah <laughs> i so I, I would actually argue that yes literalistic religion can be used that way but uh having a metaphorical approach to it can be has been harnessed in the exact same way because if there's a greater spirit of that right and you can't immediately get that through reading it yeah. then you have to elevate some religious scholar somewhere to be able to interpret that for you so that you can, so that, so that you can actually understand it. And that's the whole issue we have with the Catholic church in Europe in the, in the middle ages yeah. is that it went to, okay, this is all the allegory and you can't really understand it without coming to the church. Therefore don't, uh, don't, uh, you don't read this yourself because you don't have the capacity to understand that. Whereas a, literalistic approach kind of puts everyone on an egalitarian footing to some extent that well it means what it says you can read it and you can come to conclusions from it okay well you know you can apply this to the bible as well uh in that case i want to know i have a message for southern baptist bankers right southern baptist why a southern baptist bank who you know, adhere very literally to every single word right, of the bible why are they not forgiving all debts every seven years? That's what the Bible says you should do. <laughs> it's a very strong argument for forgiving all debts every seven years. In fact, there's a very good reason for this. That has to do with the time that it was written, a spiral of debt that farmers were getting to and being turfed off their land and so on. But that doesn't concern the literalist. All that concerns the literalist. The literalist is not interested in context. You know, and the Quran, it's all about context. The Quran is the voice of God speaking to Muhammad. God does not explain himself. God's God. Why should God explain himself? Or self, itself, whatever, right? uh, whatever um, pronoun you use. So to really understand the Quran, you have to know the context. And that's that, you know, these are revelations partly in response to what is going on at the time. And you can't un understand that without reading even Isaac and Al Tabari, and it just becomes, uh, it's not self explanatory. Neither is the Bible, neither is the sacred text. Because you know what makes them enduring is their mystery, is the fact that they can be interpreted in so many ways, is the fact that, uh, is the poetry. We go back to the poetry behind it. And the Quran, by the way, is. All poetry, right? 
in Arabic. It's an it's an it's an a, a strong Arabian poetic tradition or Arabic poet, poetic tradition. Um, most of the book is also in Hebrew, in a very very strong poetic tradition. I, I actually think of these as Middle East poetic traditions, and very often you will find um, phrases and ideas and so on that mirrored in both the Quran and the Bible, not because one took from the other or something like this, but because these are both Middle Eastern sacred texts, Middle Eastern wisdom texts. And there was a body you know, of wisdom which was shared with, through Aramaic, through Arabic, through Hebrew, through Phoenician, through all the languages of the region at the time, but mainly through Aramaic, which was the common one and so on. So you will find phrases like, you know, those with ears to hear will hear it. And you'll find them in the Dead Sea Scrolls too. And you'll find them in, in, in the Arabian Nights. And it's, it's um, I love I loved this, this sharedness of all these texts, but it's, it's a poetic shared. Right, a Does common, make this? yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's a common cultural background. And, yeah. it, se and it seems like, a lot of the, there's a lot of what's kind of going on in, in the Islamic world itself isn't so much a battle over interpretation, while though that's there, the battle over context really seems to be behind all of this. Is this a response to this thing? Is this a response to this other thing? And you can't really understand that without going. I think it's more than that. I think it's a battle over. Third is the sounds. Who owns Islam? Same thing has happening in Christianity and Judaism, right? right. I mean, um, you know, as far as ultra Orthodox Jews are concerned, well, they actually have to unwillingly acknowledge that I am a Jew because my father and my mother and so on and so on and so on, but I'm a really, really bad Jew, right? as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, total, you know, sort of total infidel and so on and so on. But they, they, you know, they can't deny the blood. <laughs> But, um, you know, I mean, I did this. Yeah, you know, who is so arrogant? One of the things that the Quran can continually, continually is arrogance, right? Who, these people are so arrogant. But imagine that they are good Muslims, right? Uh, that you know, being Muslim the way they are Muslim and so on is the only way Muslim, anyone who disagrees is the, the, the arrogance of this, let alone the sheer inhumanity of it, is just stunning. And I find the same thing, you know, there are similar kinds of people, uh, Christianity and Judaism, also in Hinduism and Buddhism. In fact, what I would like to do is to take all these dumb, literalist, radical extremist fundamentalists who think you can, you know, because they're so such great believers, they have the right to dictate to other people and even to kill other people, right? I want to take them all and stick them together on an island in the middle of nowhere. Just let them kill each other and leave the rest of us in peace because the rest of us get on just fine together. Sounds like a great reality show. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it. <laughs> that's lovely <laughs> yeah yeah we, we the, the <laughs> legality issues there but, but <laughs> I love it. who knows what the law is like once this is all over if we have a government still <laughs> probably to stop <laughs> love it just laugh <laughs> well it's been really great talking to you it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you. We should, Thank you for disagreeing with me too. I love being disagreed with. Yeah, we should, we should. I would love to have a longer conversation over coffee sometime once this all blows over. Oh God, if and when. Yes, we need yeah. the vaccine. We need the vaccine. Yeah, we, we, come from, we come from completely different angles on this and that's what makes this fun. So, oh, um, exactly. so, so where are the, where's the best, other than Audible, uh, where is the best place for people to find your books? Send everybody to Elliot Bay Books, but at the Elliot Bay Bookstores. And, you know, uh, the online bookstore, Books Online, right? Uh, Amazon.com, of course, right? <laughs> but I, you can just about anywhere. 
uh, I could say go to the bookstore and buy it at the bookstore. But most, most, I mean, Powell's and Elliot Bay Books and all big bookstores are also selling on their evening print, which is great. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you guys for listening to the Almeida Initiative podcast. We will be back next week. <laughs>